1. Back in high school, many years ago, I worked at a mall pretzel place. Every mall has them. There are a couple of things you should know about it, though. First, this was right around when food allergies were becoming a big thing and gluten-free, dairy-free was a new hot topic. You would not believe the number of people who would screech at me that we didn't have a gluten-free option at a pretzel place. Then buy one anyway, but that's a tale for another day. Additionally, we had a large influx of people of other cultures and ethnicities, so we would often make sure if someone said vegetarian or vegan or no butter, that it was a dietary and not religious or a preference. And if using the butter, which meat items like beef hot dogs and pepperoni were also dipped in, was okay. Usually people who couldn't or wouldn't eat pork or beef would be thankful I mentioned it, and we would use an alternative if need be. Second, our regulars were a combination of mall walkers who brought nothing but took all the free samples. And mall employees who also took all the samples, like it was completely acceptable because they bought a $1 coffee from us one time a month ago. And their employee discount was life and death, it's 10%. These employees were the bane of my existence. Between the creepy older men who would wander over from the search shops to leer and flirt with the 16 and 17 year old girls, and ask for infinite refills in a clearly very old cup, to the rude employees who got angry over waiting for something they special ordered, and the ones who got angry over not getting their employee discount on a dollar pretzel. I shit you not, it's a damn dollar. It was a struggle. This story revolves around a specific employee who fell into the last two categories of mall employees. A true Karen before Karens were a thing. I nicknamed God's greatest gift. Because she seemed to think she was and I still have zero idea what her actual name was. Whether it was her great accomplishment of working in a department store at 45 or her clear loyalty and kindness at frequenting our location multiple times a day for her snacks and drinks, I don't know. Anyway, we had a lovely cook from Ecuador who spoke mostly Spanish and would sometimes have to take the early orders when we just opened, while I or another employee got the drawers ready. I walked in and heard a screech and turned around. GGG had thrown her pretzel back on the counter at the cook. There's meat on this, I'm kosher. How dare you, you stupid... And then she used a rather inappropriate slur for a Spanish speaker. I can't remember, and if I could, I wouldn't repeat. I apologized to her, and said we would remake it as she stomped away. I asked the cook what happened, apparently this was a regular issue. She came in just as we were opening to order a cheese pretzel, an item not on our menu. She wanted the pizza pretzel, but without the pepperoni. It's a special order we don't do often, but it slow times can do if they're willing to wait. It looked like the pretzel had been on the same tray as the other pizza pretzels and a pepperoni had gotten cut in the melting cheese and was removed before being dipped in butter and given to the customer. Now normally if someone has an issue, a polite I'm sorry but I can't have this because I'm kosher or a vegetarian can be easily resolved with the remake and apology. GGGs seemed to do this regularly whenever she didn't get exactly what she wanted. I later found out she actually spoke fluent Spanish when she screamed at another cook for saying she was being a rude bitch in Spanish to another cook. And at any time could have explained to the cook if she needed something special. So we remade the pretzel and GGG stood there tapping her toes and mumbling about stupid Mexicans. So I decided to comply with exactly what she said. I remade the pretzel, and when it came out, carefully removed it from the tray, and placed it carefully into the paper holder. No butter. I tried to hand it to her. Where's the butter? I want butter! I'm so sorry, ma'am, but our butter is not kosher. You said you were kosher, and our meat products contain pork, and are dipped in the same butter. I can't do that. But I want butter! Yes, ma'am, but I have to respect your needs and information... You said you were kosher, and I do not want to disrespect your faith in any way. Note, I grew up with quite a few kosher friends whose families were very strict, and they let me know that not informing them or following kosher guidelines was a huge issue, and very disrespectful. 
so I always try to be careful. I'm not kosher, but ma'am, you just yelled you were kosher. And I thought we had offended you by allowing a meat product to touch your pretzel. I I'm not, no, I don't want, just put it in the butter. Are you sure, ma'am? Yes, fine, whatever. She took her pretzel and laughed. By then it was probably cold, and she didn't bother us for another month. Two. This happened during my engineering course. I've had this teacher for math in second year, and she was kind of a dick. Blowing small things out of proportion, screaming at anyone who made a mistake. Just wanting to make life harder for anyone she despised. That kind. We were pretty much used to her, so we generally laid low on her radar. But this changed when she was appointed as the first year coordinator, similar to a head of department but for my juniors. She started coming late for classes and any instance of misbehavior, she would skip what needed to be taught in that class and leave. This was a bad thing since I didn't even know what I didn't even know, and math was generally hard at this point. Now, the tasks were coming up so she gave us some problems and a bunch of reference material, and problems that should have been taught in class, asking us to solve and submit them so she can review, correct in case of any mistake. We scrambled and hustled, finally finishing them on time. We waited. Waited, but we never got those books back. Previous to the day for the test, I go to her and ask for my book. She's completely forgotten about it, starts panicking, and when I offer to come again later, she stops me. She says that since she was so busy with her new duties, she couldn't correct them, and seeing that I'm free, I need to go through them as anyways it would be like a revision for the test. I'm irked. I'm not exactly free as I had a class coming up, but she's not ready to listen to anything and hurries off elsewhere. Having no choice, I start correcting it. It takes around an hour and 15 minutes just to finish a book. She comes back, sighs, and asks me to not be lethargic and pick up speed and goes away again. Cue malicious compliance. I start ticking everything, wrong problems, incomplete problems, blank pages. I don't care. So after around 20 minutes, I've finished everyone's book and I go to look for her. Since this part of the campus is relatively small, I look for her in the small possibility of places she might have been. And lo, I find her in the cafeteria chatting with other professors, drinking coffee, having a great time. She sees me and comes along, telling me that she was in a meeting but is free now, and asks whether the work is done. She then tells me to go back and wait for her, as she will come in two minutes. All the guilt of doing a half-assed job and no work vanished by this point, and I waited for her in her cabin. When she comes back after ten minutes, she puts her signature on the corrected books, and tells me that it's my responsibility that they will be delivered to their owners. No thank you. Nothing. Just more work. I begrudgingly give them back to everyone, and by now I had lost around three to four hours and hurriedly prep for the test. By this point, I hadn't thought of the implications of what I'd done. I just wanted to get out of doing her work for her. That's when the results were shared. 73% of people had failed the test. Her cabin was stormed with pretty much everyone who insisted they had done exactly what they did in that book which she had corrected, but still didn't get any marks. She sees me standing by the door and calls me out. You, the one in the blue shirt, come here at once. This biatch doesn't even know my name and used such a shitty way of identifying me. I'm angry and I slip away since there were many students wearing blue shirts. Thus ensued more chaos, and she claimed it was that person's fault, not hers, and led to a couple of shouting matches between her and the students. Finally, the management gets involved in this, and they started reviewing what she had done, and it turns out she was giving many of her duties as a professor to the students, updating attendance and marks who had come to her cabin asking for help and with doubts, etc. They were pissed she was demoted to her former post, and was suspended without pay for six weeks. She was angry and lashed out at the board members on social media, making wild accusations against them. She deleted her posts when they informed her that if she gets another complaint against her, she will be demoted even further. 
but sadly, as it was the middle of the year, the professor couldn't be replaced, and she continued teaching in my class. I tried to wear a blue shirt whenever I had her at class, so she would be constantly reminded of what I did to her. 3. Brief Backstory A couple years ago, I was in an apartment with my friend and young sister. My sister was violent toward my friend and I, and I ended up having to get a restraining order against her. She brought in a dog without permission, which caused some damage to the unit. I informed my landlord of the incidences of violence and the damage and sent him pictures. He basically told me to deal with it myself, which I did by getting the protective order. After this, my roommate questioned the legality of holding us responsible for her portion of the rent. I told her it was, but she asked our landlord for a copy of the lease to show her uncle anyway, which admittedly was pretty stupid. Up until this point, our landlord had not asked us to leave due to my sister's actions. But he did after the lease was brought up. We were out by the date he specified on the notice to quit, the first step in the eviction process before the eviction actually occurs. My roommate was there until midnight making sure the place was spotless. We moved to an apartment across the street. Two weeks had passed since he was informed that we had vacated the unit, and we had not gotten anything regarding our security deposit. In our state, a landlord is required by law to either return the remainder of a security deposit within two weeks, or provide a letter itemizing what the deposit was used for. If they don't, the tenant is owed the entire deposit. If the withholding is willful, the tenant is owed double the original deposit. The landlord had actually told me that he would be going on vacation immediately after we vacated, so I returned our keys to him and waited to see if he would send anything. He never did. After consulting with the tenant's right group to be sure I was in the right, I sent a pre-formatted letter 16 days after we vacated, which stated the specific laws regarding security deposits, and gave him our current address to send either the deposit or receipt to. The day after I sent this letter, I see him across the street, frantically running into the apartment for the first time since we moved out. I receive a text from him saying that he would return what's left of our deposit if he could get the apartment rented by the first of next month. I respond by telling him that, as the letter I sent explained, he forfeits the right to keep any of the deposit after the two weeks is up. He responded saying that he would see us in court, and that we were nightmare tenants, and that this will be fun. He said he would also be taking us to court for the costs to relist and rent the apartment, which he claimed exceeded the amount of our deposit. After about a month or two of hearing nothing back, we decided, fuck it, and file a fall claim suit against him, as he clearly wasn't going to follow through on his threats. As the person who had almost all communication with him, I was a plaintiff in the case. He brought a letter that was dated for the day he texted me, where he arbitrarily wrote in what he used the deposit on, and claimed he sent us the letter. That obviously didn't add up, which I thoroughly explained to the judge, as he texted me that day, saying we would get some of the deposit returned, and that he had no proof that he actually sent the letter. He clearly just wrote it and printed it out for the court hearing. During the court hearing, he also said a lot of false and victim-blaming shit, such as implying that I participated in the violence that occurred, saying we caused damages that were definitely there when we moved in, and just attacking my character in general. The judge ruled that the withholding of the security deposit was willful and awarded us double the deposit. But of course, that wasn't the end of it. And a few days before his deadline to pay us the money, he sends me a text just letting me know that the decision has been appealed. I didn't answer and showed up to court again, and lo and behold, it's more mudslinging and arguing about things that we already established in the first hearing. The judge upheld the original decision, and he eventually mailed me the check for double the deposit. In the memo line on the check, where you can write the reason for the payment, he wrote for gaining 20 pounds. But hey, I cashed that check and spent my half on a new gaming laptop. So I'd say I got the last laugh. I desperately wanted to text him and ask him if it was as fun as he thought it would be, but resisted the urge. And for anyone curious, uh, as I may not have made it clear, yes, violence occurred toward me as well. I could do without the victim blaming. 
and the dog that she brought in without permission chewed a tiny chunk out of the windowsill. In court, the falsified deposit receipt letter was mostly comprised of cleaning fees and damages that were there when we moved in. 4. So this happened a few years ago when I was in the Finnish Defense Forces. Conscription in Finland is part of a general compulsion for national military service for all adult males. I'm a combat engineer, for those who want to know. I love explosions, what can I say? Explosions make you feel badass. But this story does not include any explosions. It's winter and our company was camping on a seven-day fighting exercise. After one long 12-hour day, my squad's corporal comes to me and says, Oh, P, I have a job for you. Yeah, corporal. We were on good terms, so the convo wasn't as formal as it should have been. We need at least one man to heat a sauna for the higher-ups. Are you up for the task? Sure, why not? The second lieutenant said that they will arrive at 20 hundred. So if you want, you can bathe in the sauna before they arrive. Yes! By the way, can I go to the NAFE before I go heat up the sauna? Sure. I bought a few drinks and some chocolate from the NAFE. Upon leaving, I met my second lieutenant and some other higher-ups that were going in NAFE. I saluted and held the door open for them. OP, I heard that you will be responsible for heating up our sauna, am I correct? Sir, yes, sir. Good, the sauna better be hot, or else you will have a swimming lesson this evening. Yesterday we made an ice hole in the lake nearby, understood? Sir, yes, sir. After chopping a big stack of firewood and bathing in the sauna, I remembered my second lieutenant's words about the swimming lessons. At first, I thought that it was all just talk and they wouldn't throw me in the lake. And I thought, oh wait, that would be exactly something that my second lieutenant would do. And I didn't really want to swim in water that was 4 degrees Celsius. 39.20 Fahrenheit to my American friends. Normally, when a sauna is at 80 degrees Celsius, 176 Fahrenheit, and you throw water on the sauna stove, the heat feels smooth and gentle. When a sauna is at 100 degrees Celsius, 212, and you throw water on the sauna stove, the heat can sting, but it feels good. This is normally the temperature where I like to bathe. But I didn't leave it there. I cranked up the temperature to 110, 115 degrees Celsius, 230, 239, and then went back inside to check the thermometer. I left the room almost crouching. Then at exactly 20 hundred, my second lieutenant and a few other higher-ups came. Among them, I noticed the captain of my company. I almost crapped my pants and started to regret my decisions, but what's done is done. I saluted and informed them that the sauna is ready. At ease, OP, you may leave. Sir, yes, sir. They entered the sauna and I left. I left fast. I ran faster than I have ever ran. I was the flash disguised as an engineer. They knew and I knew who was responsible for heating up the sauna. I knew that I was screwed and I thought that I would be cleaning the toilets the whole next month. But nothing out of normal happened in the last few days. After the exercise, our platoon was called to the auditorium where our second lieutenant told us how the exercise went. The company captain was there too, and when the second lieutenant had finished, he walked in front of us and called. Is Engineer OP here? Sir, I'm here. All eyes were fixated on me. Come here. I said my prayers silently and thought, This is how I die. The captain handed me a coupon to Naffy. The coupon can be exchanged for one free coffee and donut. I was baffled. This is for you. You did a great job in the exercise. I thanked him and went back to my seat. Later I learned that the second lieutenant had saved my ass and told the captain that I had followed his commands. The second lieutenant had also requested that I would be given the coupon. By the way, these coupons are a common way to reward privates. 5. A few years ago, my best friend and I rented a tiny two-bedroom flat together. This place was kind of terrible. My friend's room had a hole cut into the wall, so the last foot of the bed would fit. This became a mantelpiece in the next room. The kitchen was the size of a child's playhouse kitchen, and the upstairs neighbors spent all hours of the day and night screaming at each other or having loud sex. But we were mostly happy, 
because we were over living with six plus other people. We paid £75 a week plus bills for this place, which was pretty standard for a two-bed flat in our area. The six months into our one-year contract, the landlord sold the terrace house our flat and five others was a part of to a middle-aged married couple who were first-time landlords. They were the kind of people who thought they were smarter than everybody else, and I got the impression they thought property management was going to be the easiest thing ever. We had no problem throughout the sale process. We were assured nothing would change. We didn't interact much with the landlord before anyway. Then, two weeks after the sale, we got an email from the couple saying we owed them £20 more a week. Basically, in our contract, it stated our rent was £75 each a week about 10 times. But there was a typo where it said our rent was £95 each. So they said they could legally charge us £95. We laughed at this. But when it became clear they were serious, we reached out to a letting agent and got them to put it in writing that it was a typo. Our rent was always £75. And they even gave us the original advert for the flat with the correct rent on it. We thought this would be the end of it. We were wrong. The couple insisted on coming to our flat for an in-person meeting. When they got there, they said that they asked our old landlord about it, and he was shocked that we'd not been paying enough for six months now, and the rent was always £95. I didn't buy this because they had nothing in writing. But I made the argument that of course he would say that, because he wouldn't want it to seem like he sold under false pretenses. And if we'd been underpaying by a total of like £160 a month then why had he never spoken to us about it? They said that he was a busy guy with too many properties, but then the husband spent ages condescendingly explaining mortgages to us. Then they declared that if we did not start paying them the higher rent, they would evict us, and we had 24 hours to pay or 30 days to get out, and they left. Honestly, I think they saw two 22-year-old girls and thought they could scare us into paying more money. What they didn't know is that my friend and I are very pleasant until you piss us off, and we become vindictive motherfuckers. We decided that night that if they wanted to evict us from this shithole, we were going to make them do it properly, and if they were so pedantic about contracts and rules, we were going to stop letting anything slide. The couple woke up the next morning with an email from our lawyer, my flatmate's brother, a bored lawyer with time on his hands, requesting a formal eviction notice in writing, and laying out a record of last night's conversation. Thing was, they didn't actually have legal grounds to evict us because even if we went to court and a judge favoured their interpretation of the contract, we were advised this was unlikely, we still didn't owe them more than a month's rent, which would have been their only legal way of evicting us because we were otherwise great tenants. By 9.15am they were ringing us, but we ignored them and emailed that our lawyer had advised us to only communicate in writing. We then sent out an email informing them that the fancy new front door they had just installed could not be unlocked from the inside without a key, which violated fire safety laws. And unfortunately, if this wasn't rectified ASAP, we would have to report it. We then sent texts that showed them repeatedly entering our flat with less than 24 hours notice. And did they know that this was illegal? Maybe we should talk to the other tenants because if they're doing this to everyone, then this could be quite a problem. After about three days of this, we received a very nice email saying that they don't agree that our rent was supposed to be £75 each week, but they would graciously allow us to finish out our contract at that rate. By this point, we'd found a flat triple the size for £80 each week and wanted to get out of that hamster cage. So we offered to move if they signed mutual surrender forms. They eagerly agreed. The best part was they stubbornly tried to rent that flat at the higher rate, despite us telling them that it was a terrible idea. And the flat was empty for over a year. And because they had agreed to end our contract early, they got stuck paying the council tax, not me. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream. Number 52. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Been having a bit of a delicate time over the past couple of days. Things do seem to be settling down a bit today though, thankfully. 
Uh, so I was able to do the stream I wanted to do last night today. Uh, and suddenly, as I am feeling a bit better, I keep thinking about chicken tikka. I got ingredients to make it a few days ago. I was just sitting there waiting patiently until I get off my butt and do it. If I get done early enough, because um, I am recording early, I might actually do it today. We'll see. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourself.